As testing begins for stall holders at yet another food centre, our expert discusses whether Singapore is on target for June the 21st. The lecturer in this viral video is about to get the sack at Neon Poly for serious misconduct. And with the lingering uncertainty of whether dining in will be allowed, ST's food editor talks about private dining businesses. Hello, I'm Olivia Kueh. You're watching The Big Story live in the Straits Times newsroom. You can subscribe to our channel so you never miss a single episode. 20 new COVID-19 cases in the community were confirmed today, two currently unlinked. The other 18 linked cases comprise 13 identified during quarantine and five detected through surveillance testing. There were also seven imported cases with three returning Singaporeans or PRs. More details will be released later tonight. 130 workers from yet another food centre are undergoing mandatory COVID-19 testing. At least the process was quick and smooth for stall holders and cleaners from the Teluk Blanga Drive Food Centre. This exercise comes after yesterday's confirmation that a second worker at the food centre was infected. Now she works part-time there and is a household contact of an earlier case, a hawker at the same food centre who's linked to the cluster at Bukit Merah View, which had 39 cases as at last night. Professor Chiu Yi Ying joins me now. He's the Dean of the Saw Sui Hock School of Public Health at NUS. Welcome back to the show, Prof. Well, Book and Mera views growing cluster. What does that situation tell us? Are our measures not enough to curb the spread? Or are they, in fact, robust enough that we're able to pick up a lot more cases which could have gone undetected otherwise? Or is it that the virus is even more transmissible than we think? So thank you for having me back. I think the, the dominant strain of the virus that is circulating in Singapore, which we call the Delta variant, is definitely a lot more transmissible. And we are only starting to learn exactly how much more transmissible this is. So from the UK, they estimated that the reproductive number of the Delta variant is between five to eight. And if we take the higher estimate of eight, it actually means that one person will spread to eight others after one cycle. And this expands to 64 after two cycles and 512 infected cases after three cycles. Now, if we compare this with the wild type variant that the world saw in early parts of 2020, which has a reproductive number of between two to three, we are really looking at 27 infected cases after three cycles. So in three cycles, one person will spread to 512 other people if that first person was infected with the Delta variant. Whereas previously, we are only looking at 27 others after three cycles. And this is exactly what we mean when we say that the virus is now a lot more transmissible. And besides, I use the word cycle. So for the strain that we saw last year, we were looking at each cycle of between five to 10 days. But actually now for the current variant, the Delta variant, each cycle now appears to be even shorter that people can be contagious after only one to two days. So not only are we looking at the Delta variant spreading to more people, the speed of this spread is also happening faster. So if we come back to your question about whether our measures are sufficient to catch the spread, to curb the spread, it is clear that our measures to get people to work from home, not to permit dining in, effectively curbing social interactions. This have all worked to reduce human interactions and human traffic in public spaces. We have also seen how case numbers did fall to single digits again after about two to three weeks with these measures. So we know they work well and they can work again. But what we, what we need to realize is really that because of this Delta variant, community transmissions now have a much higher chance of being a super spreader event. Previously, we call this a super spreader event and it's deemed to be quite rare and only happened during very high risk activities, such as we have large groups of people coming together, karaoke singing, talking together without masks for a long time. But now it seems that short-term interactions may already be sufficient to seed large clusters and so I think we really need to change our game plan to stay ahead. And we, we have done that with our expanded surveillance, testings of large groups of people, getting first degree contacts, their family, household members to stay in isolation for seven days well, and more. Or 
we actually need to start changing our mindset towards COVID-19 as well. If our long-term game plan is to consider this as an endemic disease. We're all looking forward to Monday when the second stage of Phase 3 heightened alert is scheduled to start. But Finance Minister Lawrence Wong, he said yesterday that the Multi-Ministry Task Force is reviewing the timing and the scope of when that can happen. Well, that stage comprises um, an easing for things like dine-in services, gyms and in-person tuition and enrichment classes. Prof, in the event that we're not ready for all of that, do you foresee a hold on the entire slew of measures or just on some? So all the services that we mentioned, such as dining in, exercising in gyms, tuition in person, enrichment classes, all of this involve prolonged periods of interacting within a closed indoor environment. So the risk involved is actually quite similar from a public health perspective. But when we start to think about coping with COVID-19, it has never been just about the public health. It's also about how to balance people's jobs, income, livelihoods, the economy. So some of these services that we talk about may be deferred because the impact to jobs and the economy is lesser. So maybe they can be delayed a bit more, a bit longer. But there may be other services that cannot be deferred for too long without causing substantial economic hardship. So I would not want to speculate what would happen other than to say that this is a really difficult decision for any policymakers, especially during this transition period where we are rolling out our vaccines as fast as we can, but yet have not achieved the vaccination level in the population that allows us to open up more confidently, especially in light of the more transmissible Delta variant. Well, let's uh, talk more about dining in, you know, which is one of the things that you know, we're all most looking forward to, to do again. Well, ever since last week, FMB businesses have made preparations to welcome back diners on Monday. But with Mr Wong's update yesterday, uncertainty lingers. So instead of having a blanket rule, sorry, shall we say, of completely not allowing dining in services, are there more nuanced approaches that can be explored, perhaps, you know, to allow dining in for groups of two or allow it in outdoor settings like hawker centres with which have you know better airflow and ventilation so as mentioned previously it's a very difficult decision to make and and it goes beyond the public health considerations and you mentioned the outdoor settings such as hawker centres i think it is perhaps useful to highlight that uh, hawker centres themselves may not be entirely free from the risk of outbreaks either because we have seen that what is happening right now in the recent food centre outbreaks are happening in Bukit Merah View, Red Hill. These are food centres that we are talking about. And I think the reason why we are starting to see these outbreaks happening in markets and food centres or even previously supermarkets and malls is because these are the locations that people are more likely to congregate now in larger crowds. If we have allowed people to go back to work or we have allowed dining in or more social activities, actually, we would see equally work sites or work venues or social activities venues to be, to be the drivers of these outbreaks. And because our vaccination uptake in the population is not sufficiently high yet, we would still need to be fairly cautious in deciding what is permitted and to what extent. Because based on the case numbers, especially the unlinked case numbers, I actually think that we can permit some degree of dining in to resume, but this needs to be communicated very clearly to the public that the situation remains very precarious and we encourage people to dine in only if they are from the same households because right now the rule is you could have five people to dine in. So perhaps dine in in, in restaurants or in eateries, hawker centres, if you are within the same household. Try to essentially minimise any cross-household interactions or, or, or just coming together for social gatherings. It's a tricky situation. And I, I think I don't, I don't claim to have the answers to all of the questions that you have asked, but I do believe that we can allow for some relaxation of the restrictions, but we do require the cooperation and the understanding from members of the public in this. Well, Professor, it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Thanks, as always, for your time. That was Professor Tio Yik Ying, Dean of NUS's Sorcery Hawk School of Public Health.
As we wait for updates on the second stage of Phase 3 heightened alert, one thing that's certain is that from tomorrow, those interested to take the Sinovac vaccine can contact the 24 selected private clinics for more details on how they may receive the shot. Now, these 24 were chosen based on their location, but also on their ability to safely, properly and officially administer the vaccines, as well as to set a suitable cost, which is expected to range from $10 to $25 per dose. The health ministry said that as the vaccine is being provided to the institutions for free, there shouldn't be any additional costs beyond vaccination administration fees, which already include consultation charges and GST. We'll tune into tomorrow's show as we'll be speaking to a clinic that will be providing the Sinovac vaccine. In non-COVID-19 news, Nee An Polly is in the process of sacking senior lecturer Tan Bun Lee for serious misconduct. This after it completed internal investigations into two incidents. The first involves Mr Tan captured on video making racist remarks to an interracial couple in Orchard Road. The video went viral when it was posted online on June the 6th. And the second incident surfaced just three days later. On Instagram, Mr Tan's former student, Nurul Fatima Iskandar, alleged that he made Islamophobic comments in her class back in 2017. And in a statement today, NP stressed that, quote, our staff members are expected to respect cultural, ethnic and religious differences in our society. They must uphold secularity and impartiality at all times. The disciplinary action meted out against the staff in question reflects our commitment to provide a safe, inclusive and respectful environment for our campus community. The poly also apologised for the distress that Mr Tan's comments caused Ms Nurul and said it's offered her counselling support. According to a Manpower Ministry report today, after four straight quarters of decline, total employment rose by 12,200 in Q1. Resident hires continued to increase, driven by the broad hiring of residents in the service sectors like information and communications, FNB, health and social services, and administrative and support services. And this is outpacing the decline in non-resident employment, which is partly due to restrictions on the inflow of foreign workers. Meanwhile, unemployment rates continued to ease after peaking in September last year. In March, this dropped to 2.9% overall, 4.2% for citizens and 4% for residents. They're still higher than pre-pandemic levels though. But returning to pre-COVID levels are retrenchments for the second consecutive quarter. The re-entry rate also rose for two straight quarters to 66.2%. Workplace injuries, I beg your pardon. Meanwhile, in a Facebook post today, Manpower Minister Tan Si Leng said that while the latest labour figures are good signs, the government expects recovery to remain uneven across sectors. He also stressed that businesses must innovate and transform and workers must reskill and upskill. Workplace injuries caused by slips, trips and falls in the F&B industry have risen by an average of 12% a year in the four years before the pandemic. And so a new year-long slips, trips and falls or STF campaign was launched today by the Workplace Safety and Health Council. It will call on companies to implement these five key actions that require them to set aside time to check for hazards, clean up work areas and share safety messages with their workers on a regular basis. The council aims to reach out to 14 associations across the F&B, logistics and transport and facilities management sectors. Well, fingers crossed that dining in at restaurants will be allowed again when Monday rolls around. And that got us wondering how COVID-19 restrictions affect private dining businesses where customers go to the chef's home for a meal. Well, here to shed some light on this is ST's food editor, Tan Xie Yuan. Welcome back to the show, Xie. So let's use a place that you recently reviewed right. as a, a, a case study of sorts, Pan Im, which serves refined Thai food at owner Vincent Pang's house. How has he 
managed to pivot his private dining business during the latest round of measures? And, you know, is it easier for smaller businesses like Panim to come up with alternatives during this difficult period of time? Well, it kind of really depends on the kind of food that you serve. So, um, Pan Im does, uh, it, like a lot of other private dining businesses, have had to do um, to offer takeout food or um, delivery, food to be delivered to people's homes because they simply can't um, host uh, people in, in their own uh, homes, right? And the thing with Pan Im is that the food's super refined. It's a similar experience to eating in a, in a high-end restaurant. Um, you know, he does elements of molecular gastronomy. He does, you know, and everything is beautifully plated. You know, the whole the, being in his apartment and everything is all part of the whole Pan Im experience. So like a lot of private dining businesses which have that kind of vibe, he's had to retool his offering and come up with food that will travel well. The meals that he, he is selling for takeaway is not as, um, the meals are not as um, elaborate as, as you might have in his home. So it is still multi-course, but it's not going to be quite the same. And um, I have to say that I was really impressed with the food because um, he managed to figure out what would travel well, what would be heat properly. And, and then he just went for it. And, and the flavors are robust. They are new ones. They are hot, sour, salty, sweet, which is a hallmark of, of Thai cooking. And he brought all of these elements into, into like packed meals in takeout boxes. And I remember um, I shared the meal with my family and we all fell in love with the rice. I mean, you, you can say that rice is like the, the throwaway item, right? It's just rice. But his rice is cooked with coconut milk. And it's like the greens are like distinct. Um, there's this wonderful aroma. Um, and it goes so well with the rest of his food. You know, I mean, hands down, I would rather go eat at his home. But if I can't, if, res if restaurants and private dining businesses cannot reopen, then I think the second best that I can live with. Okay, so let's talk more about the food, which may be a bit tricky to review for you because, you know, the menu changes every fortnight. But Shre, are there any staples? Because you mentioned rice earlier, right? Or perhaps you could give us an indication of, yeah. of the overall quality and experience mm -hmm. that someone can expect from dining uh, mm -hmm. with a Pan Im. Okay, so um, if, if I were going to order his food regularly, I really would want to have a different menu each time I do. Not, I don't want to eat the same thing, right? So you can always count on Vincent to do something amazing with beef. There will be a beef course, there will always be a soup. And, um, and you can expect like the main course would be substantial and it will go really well with rice. And there will be a salad of some sort. Um, and you know Thai salads are just so zing and vibrant. So really, I mean, yes, I had one of those menus, but pretty much if you... And, and the thing is that Vincent's meals are so sought after that you're just really lucky to get a slot. Do you know what I mean? Um, and unless you have like really strong allergies, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be amazing. So sure, you know, we are very much looking forward to Monday when dining in at restaurants is supposed to, to restart again. So can we get your quick take? Do you think that will happen in a few days' time? I don't think there's a chance that it will happen. From what Lawrence Wong said on Facebook and Instagram yesterday, I just don't see how they're going to let restaurants reopen. So I think you should go book that slot for a pan in meal takeaways are still going to be the norm, at least for the next couple of weeks. Oh, very enlightening indeed. Thanks very much, Xue. I've been speaking with food editor Tan Xue Yun with Dining In still banned for now. You can order set meals for delivery in the meantime. Go to the owner's Instagram page at Vincent PJY to find out how to order these meals, when to order and what you can order.
Hey, look out for our new Pixar movie tomorrow on Disney+. Plus. If you can't holiday in Italy right now, watching Luca may be the next best thing. Set in an idyllic seaside town on the Italian Riviera, it takes us through an adventure with the main character, Luca, and his best friend, Alberto. And I should mention that both of them are some sort of sea creature. Well, film correspondent John Louis is here with more. So, John, an animated movie about sea creatures who transform into humans, it reminds me, first of all, of The Little Mermaid, but you've compared it with a, a more recent offering from Pixar, 2017's Coco. So how does Luca measure up? Well, The Little Mermaid was more or less a princess story. This is, isn't a princess story. Yeah, the, the two people, the two boys in there are sea creatures who come on land. So there's a similarity with Little Mermaid. But it's more like Coco in the sense that they come from a village, multi-generational multi family. It's warm, it's loving, it's filled with good food. And it's also some sort of similar, uh, similar cultural background there. One is Italian, one is Mexican, of course. So what you have there is a very colorful and warm Mediterranean setting. Well, as you know, Pixar films are held to an incredibly high standard. Among other things, they're famous for stories that entertain both kids and adults. Do you think Luca meets these very high expectations? Yes, it does. Um, visually, okay, it's not as lush as Coco. You know, you don't have the big parade scenes. It's a small, intimate setting. And yeah, like I said, it's not a princess story. It's seen through the eyes of two boys who are shape-changing sea creatures. And they have an adventure in the town of Porto Rosso. So it's a coming-of-age story. It's a bit of a buddy comedy. One boy is very shy, played by uh, uh, Jacob Tremblay from Room, if you can remember. And the other is Jack Dylan Grazer, who was in It, the, the horror movie. So it's a fun boys' adventure comedy. Well, thanks, John. That's a lovely, light-hearted one to watch this weekend. Luca drops on Disney Plus tomorrow. Well, next up, a new exhibition by Singapore's oldest living pioneer artist, Lim Tzu Peng, who turns 100 years old in September. The showcase, titled Soul of Ink, Lim Tzu Peng at 100, was launched just this week at the Arts House by Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong. Well, joining us is journalist To Wen Lee to tell us more. Welcome back, Wen Lee. Can you elaborate on the cultural significance of Mr. Lim's work and how does that translate into what's included in this exhibition? Yeah, so Mr. Lim Zipeng um, is um, well known as a calligrapher as well as uh, a painter. Um, in, in this particular exhibition, um, we get to see about 20 of his most recent works which were completed between last year and this year. So um, one thing that does strike out is how innovative his work continues to be and how he um, how he's so adept at um, at ink um, painting as well as calligraphy, and we do see quite a few um, abstract pieces. Um, for example, um, there's one abstract work um, taking there's one abstract work that depicts lines from this Chinese um, heroic poem Man Jiang Hong, uh, which which kind of um, shows off his abstract style. And there are a couple of others which which also demonstrate this um, this sense of what he calls Hu Tu Zi, which is muddled calligraphy. Um, where the, the words are so abstract um, that you can't even make them up. So it's um, th that's something to look out for. Um, another thing about this exhibition is that the works are very colourful. We see so many splashes of colour um, by the artist as he um, heads into his um, hundredth year. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Well, so well, definitely a show um, that well with the... Uh, yeah. Well, Wenli, you mentioned already, you know, some pieces that we should look out for. What are the other must-see ones? Yeah, there are a couple of, um, I think there are four paintings which were started in the 1980s. Um, and last year, the artist took them out again and he added more colours to them. So they're kind of neon-like, um, brighter hues. Um, so, so you do get a sense of, of an artist who is trying to constantly um, push the boundaries and, and you know, um, make things new again in a sense. Um, there are some interest, it's also an um, interesting 
figurative um, streetscape of a shop house in Crater Aya. And if it's this huge, um, it measures about two meters by 2.4 meters. And you can sort of make out um, dried fish hanging along, alongside undergarments um, outside one of these shop houses. So that attention to detail, especially since this was the work that was um, painted from memory, is, is quite, um, it's quite interesting. Well, sounds very interesting indeed. Thanks so much, Wen Lee. The exhibition will run until June the 30th at the Arts House. There is a book as well already out at major bookstores. Well, lots more ideas in the Friday pages of tomorrow's paper. And for more news and videos, visit straightstimes.com. And of course, subscribe to our YouTube channel by hitting the red button below. I'm Olivia Quake. See you tomorrow on The Big Story.